Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host Gary Cohen and on today's episode I have Bob Troyer. Bob is an entrepreneur, he's a creative technologist, musician, athlete, he's a quantified self and one serious biohacker from New York City. Bob, thanks so much for coming on to the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Gary. Sure. So, you know, the whole concept of the show is called Biohackers Lab, and it's all about N equals 1 experimentation and what people get to do to their own bodies to test things to make themselves better. And, I mean, you're, you're at a whole other level compared to what most people are, and that's why you're called Quantified Bob. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's actually a self-given name uh, for lack of anything else. I don't think I... Uh, I didn't necessarily earn it as much as I when I started writing about my self-tracking exploits and biohacking exploits. I uh, I just needed a catchy name <laughs> for my site. So it's very Bob. cool. So yeah, yeah, and that's the key thing here. So um, we're talking about quantified self and biohacking, and and they're really the same thing, aren't they? Would you say? The way I look at it is they're similar in many ways, but there are differences. So if you think of like um a Venn diagram where you have um, two circles that might slightly overlap. And if you put sort of quantified self in one of those circles and biohacking in the other, I mean, th there is an overlap where in the middle, uh, I, I kind of put myself in that middle part where you're kind of applying a lot of the techniques and, 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 and tools and information in, in certain ways. But I do think there might be people on one end of the spectrum and the other who don't necessarily associate themselves um, with the other. An example would be Quantified self isn't all about your body or health. Um, you can be tracking your driving. You can be tracking things you watch on television or movies you watch. Uh, yeah, so there's finances. So there's that element of it. And on the biohacking side, there are many people who they're just looking for ways to really find these uh, shortcuts or, or optimizations to, let's say, cognitive performance or other parts of their well-being. So maybe they're taking nootropics, et cetera. So they maybe are not going to sit there and massively quantify what they're doing they're just going to be maybe basing it on feelings um mm -hmm. or you know so uh, there there's definitely an overlap and i do feel like that community is an extension of each of them kind of really uh complement each other but they're a bit different mm, that's yeah that's some really good points there but now yeah it, what's interesting is because we're talking about the quantified self aspect where you track stuff and i mean you are a master of tracking data on yourself, on your health, own health. Um, and we'll get on into that, which I want to talk about with your Bob API. But if you wouldn't mind, just explain to listeners, how did you get started into this whole movement? What, what, what sparked your interest? I've always been like interested in understanding how things work. Uh, from Let's say I was back as a little kid taking things apart. Um, I have a very inquisitive mind. Uh, as I got older got more into athletics and things like performance. So you start getting into the areas of looking at, you know, tracking your workouts and diet and figuring out ways to optimize your performance. Um, it wasn't until, you know, so this was always something I was just doing. I didn't think of anything like quantified self. Um, there really weren't that many great tools out there. A lot of this stuff was being done with a, a tape measure, stopwatch, pencil, paper. Uh, and it's really just been over the last, let's say, you know, five to seven years where the technology has evolved where things are getting out of the laboratory and out of research to, to the end consumers. And we're able to track and understand things that were either impossible to do just a few years ago or very, very expensive or inconvenient. So, you know, I, I had been kind of going down this path, um, you know, especially on the health side, as you get a little bit older, you move from the performance side, now looking into your wellness, maybe a little more uh, into areas like longevity. Mm -hmm. And and uh, for me, it was um, when I came across uh, this organization, which is called Quantified Self, and they had started out in the Bay Area of San Francisco in the United States, and it was a small group of people, and they had extent, uh, created a bunch of meetups that were growing around the country, and I ran into some folks in New York City uh, that were getting together, and I was you know, watching these presentations some people were giving on things they were tracking, and, and this is stuff that I was always doing, but I kept it private because I kind of thought maybe people would think it was weird or just didn't care about it. Uh, and I found these like like-minded folks and I was like, wow, there's actually a community of people that are all kind of doing the same thing. And, and no one had really ever put like a label on it. And, um, and from there, you know, I, I, I realized that, you know, I was getting inspiration from these other people learning about other ways people were tracking things or setting up self experiments. Um, I didn't have a background necessarily in statistics or in, in research. Um, so, uh, you know, everyone was really kind of like 
just um, sponging information off each other, learning how to uh, compare notes. And one of the things we realized was we're all the sort of end of one. We're all um, experiments of one person. So it doesn't mean that my results are going to be exactly the same as yours or another person's. And that's kind of the beauty of it. We're, we're learning about ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, fast forward a, l- a little further and we start seeing the concept of biohacking take more um, – getting more attention and awareness. And I, again, had the, um, I was able to meet up with some folks very early on that were, I guess, what you would call the early uh, pioneers of the biohacking movement, uh, let's say. And again, it was an area where we're all just exploring and there was more tools and modalities and, and connecting with people uh, who now maybe had other areas of expertise, like perhaps coming from functional medicine or from training or, uh, you know, other areas, neuro, um, you know, people that could that kind of were introducing concepts that were just you know for me were just crazy because that gave me insights into ways that I could be attracting other things that I never even knew existed and um, you know then I shortly after that I started writing about my my sort of ex- experiences in the space and launched a blog uh, probably about four or five years ago um, just thinking it was a place for me to get my thoughts down kind of document some of my experiences and, and then I noticed that people were kind of coming across these post I was making and, um, you know, that maybe I was at first a little bit embarrassed about, but people were saying, yeah, I was trying to track the same thing. Or you had some information that really inspired me to try to do my own experiment. And I did it a different way, or maybe they pointed out something wrong I was doing, um, and helped me, you know, maybe figure out a way to do it better in the future. Uh, and from there, it's just been, you know, just kind of continuing down that path and, and just understanding, you know, not just like what you can track. And it's not about being like, the most quantified person in the world. I mean, to be honest, it's more about collecting a bunch of information in ways that doesn't in itself create more of a burden for yourself. And then um, using that data to kind of maybe uh, pull out insights. Um, so for me, it was a combination of learning about myself, but maybe also trying to fix or improve certain areas of my physiology mm-hmm. or, or, you know, just my well-being. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because in, in healthcare, you, people always are told, you know, listen to your body. You know, your body's telling you what you want, what's good for you, what's not good for you. It's just you're able to take it to another level where you could have those feelings, which are subjective, but then you've, you're have you able to tap into objective measures where, you, like, you could draw some blood or you do some measurements through a device or something, and you go, oh, okay, so the way I'm feeling, my body's actually internally doing the same thing, and you get to play with things. So you have a better understanding of yourself. Correct. And I, and I think, you know, I, 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 like I didn't start from day one with like a million data points or, di- you know, things I was uh, sort of gathering data on. I think over time I learned um, what, what sort of areas you could sort of take data points from or correlate them or get some baseline. So if we talk just about something like blood work or, you know, you're, the average person probably goes once a year for a checkup and maybe they get some blood work done. And that's a very like, that's like one point in time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I found that with certain things, you need a little more frequency or you need a little more of a historic baseline because then you can really see if something is going out of out of whack or, or is on its way to maybe, you know, something could just not look right. Mm. Um, and, for, and for me, what sort of opened my eyes was, because again, this is probably about five years ago, I you know, I, I thought I was super healthy and kind of active. I played sports. I was running a successful company. Um, but, but at one point, I just, you know, I, I thought I was eating a healthy diet. So it was like the, you know, lean proteins and, uh, you know, lots of pasta and all that sort of stuff. And, and uh, definitely wasn't paleo at that, at that time. And, um, or what you would call a paleo-like diet. And I remember I hit this point where um, I just had so much going on and I, kind of just curled up in a ball on my, my sofa because I, I was just out of energy. I, I just was, I don't know. I, it was like, it was a weird, it was a weird feeling. Cause I was like, I felt like I was at the top of my game and all sort of aspects of life. But then I just was like, my body was just sort of shutting down. And, and that kind of got me on the, um, the path to trying to peel back all the layers of the onion and sort of figure out what is really going on, you know, cause in my body or with me, um, because you might look, you know, you look a certain way on the outside, but things on the inside are very different. And I honestly didn't, I thought I knew a lot about sort of biology and things like that at the time. And, and it really, it was like, I had to take a deep dive and, and, you know, surround myself with a, a, a great network and team of people that were, I felt were experts in certain areas that were kind of educating me on it and kind of slowly realizing as I peeled things back, um, kind of what were, were there some things that had been, you know, it going on for years or decades that I'm sort of now having spent years to unravel and, and you know, and then correct. Cause mm-hmm. I think <laughs> that's the other thing is like you, 
you know, we, we take years and decades to get into a certain condition, but we expect to, to like unra- uh, reverse overnight and you, it doesn't work like that. You, you, it takes time. Yes. Yeah. So have you, uh, you've already got me thinking then, have you looked at uh, Dave Feldman's work with cholesterol? Do you know Dave? No, I don't, unfortunately. Oh, no, you sorry. would love Dave's stuff. So Dave Feldman, yeah. um, he when you were talking about doing blood work more often, I think, what's he done? 68 blood draws in six months or oh, something. It's in 12 months. But basically, if you ever want to know anything about cholesterol, um, hit, you, I, I did an interview with Dave and um, he's figured out a protocol, Feldman protocol, how, how he shows how to manipulate cholesterol within three days. So you would love his That's data true. points. He's he's yeah. si- he's also super serious about collecting data on on cholesterol measurements. Well, that's that's really interesting because I've actually one of the um, an experiment I'm currently involved with is actually a it's it's a little more of a group experiment with maybe a dozen people that's through the quantified self group where we're going to be exploring high frequency cholesterol tracking. So there's some devices that we got um, access to that let you essentially do the testing at home. Uh, so where, you know, there's probably gonna be a margin of error versus, you know, going to a lab and doing it, but I still think we, it's going to give us insights as to probably similar to what, what, um, uh, is it David Feldman? Yeah. 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 So, so maybe, so I'll definitely look that up because, um, because I think that's a great example of where, you know, you, you collect enough data points and you kind of see, you see any trends or you see where there aren't trends or mm-hmm. you see what, uh, you know, things that may be applied to him that that's only because of maybe the way, you know his his diet or the you know amount of physical activity and things he's doing but it might not it might be totally different for somebody else Mm -hmm. yeah you'll you'll love his stuff because he's also just done a mass so he did a n equals one and then he did it at ketocon he did a mass experiment and he and he proved his his protocol it did it the same to the masses so no uh, i won't go too deep into that rover hole but i think you'll love his data points and and his findings awesome Yeah. yeah um so now I want to get more onto you with your Bob API. I mean, this is fascinating. So you're a so- you know software and software development. And when people talk about things like APIs, I-, I think of, you know, computers and computers can talk to computers. But you've, you've released your health as, as an API. So anyone in the world can access your, your health, your information. Is that how it works? Correct. So, you know, an API just stands for um, application programming interface. And yes, originally it was a, a way for one piece of software to make a request and communicate with another piece of software, you know, whether it's through the, you know, through the web or uh, the internet, let's say, and grab that information in a structured way that it can then parse out and you know, use, do whatever it wants with. Uh, I, you know, I've been collecting a lot of data from a lot of different sources, uh, you know, whether it's wearables, you know, I'm, I think I'm wearing like three things right now because I'm actually comparing, <laughs> yeah. like I'm comparing to see like how my sleep tracking is between them because they're, they don't, none of these devices correlate with each other too well. Um, so that's a different story, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, I, as I was collecting all this data, I, yeah, the problem is like everyone, all these manufacturers will make like an app or have some tool that says, you know, we'll be your health vault or your data vault for all your information. but really only works with their devices. They might open it up to allow you to say like maybe connect, oh, here's, you know, if you have a such and such scale, you can connect that data as well. But until, but nobody has everything. And so the problem is for me, the fact that nobody has everything, it, 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 it kind of doesn't work for me. I wanted to have all my data in one location. And not only that, different tools and providers have their data in different formats. And I wanted to normalize it so I could do apples to apples comparisons of data and not have to like, manipulate something from one format to another Mm -hmm. so what i set out to do is i I, it started out just me building a simple database for lack of you know just a place for me to pull in all my data on on my own server and just have and just have it there in in a way that i know i can um query against or or, you know derive insights from i wasn't worried about like there's a lot of cool um, apps and tools out there that make you know nice dashboards and pretty graphs and tools and I was just like, no, I just want the data. <laughs> like, I, 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 you know, the, you can do all that once you have the data. But if you don't have the data in, the, in a good format, all that other stuff is kind of irrelevant. It's not going to be accurate. So I, um, yeah, I spent some time, you know, uh, putting together this this platform for myself that let me aggregate in. Uh, I started with a lot of just um, more biometric data, so a lot of the wearables and, and things. And, and that was a kind of a, a fun little process because some of the devices didn't necessarily have an easy way to get the data off their servers to get it into my um, my database. So you had to figure workarounds for that. Other cases, like I spent a bunch of time writing code for one device, and let's say that company went out of business or the device was discontinued. So, but at least I had that record of that data. Mm. So once I built, so once I built it, you know, I 
I was kind of like thinking to myself, well, you know, I, I share a lot of my stuff that I do on my site, and my blog, like, why can't I just let anyone, if somebody wants to access it, maybe, um, cause I, over, over the past few years, I would get inquiries from people, mostly like researchers or at a university where they said, Hey, you know, do you have any, let's say, um, you know, do you have any heart rate data we can borrow for some, you know, we're going to do some analysis. And I'd be like, sure. I'd have to like send it to them. But now I can just say to them, you know, I can point them to a, a little endpoint on my website, uh, you know, my API and be like, go here and you can pull down whatever you need. And just, you know, and, um, yeah, that's, that's you know, incredible. Granted, yeah. And, and, you know, when I, and what's great about it is once I sort of figured out the framework that I wanted, um, and, and first of all, let me take a step back and say, like, I'm not the first person to think of, like, building a personal API. I mean, there are other people who have done sort of variations of it. I think maybe what I did was put it together in a way that's just a little more sort of publicly available and open-ended. Um, and and so what I'm doing now is, as I'm using it and other people are accessing it, like, I'm still iterating on it. I'm adding in more sort of data sources. I'm bringing more online. So, like, an example would be, like, Whereas the, the biometric data from wearables, that, that sort of information is already in a format that I can just dump right into uh, into the database. Things like some like blood work and some health records that are much more like paper based. I'm having to now transcribe and get them into a, a format where I can now you know bring them in. And, and over time, I'll I'll be adding in more and more layers to this. So, but for me, it was just a, I just wanted a place where I can you know put all this information and have like access to it anytime I wanted to. Well, I can imagine the gadget companies must love you because that they would love to be able to just pull in, you know, I, I'm thinking I'm setting up some new health device and hey, if I could just get access to these people's data, I could start, you know, deciding on, I guess, on certain things. Well, yeah. And a lot of, a lot of these companies, I mean, to, to be honest, the business model isn't necessarily the, where, the device you're wearing, it's the data they're gathering. So like when you see something like a Fitbit or a Jawbone, you know, one of these wearables that you'll, you know, tracks your activities and sleep, like especially when one of them, you find out they're struggling and in financial straits, they're up for, let's say the assets are for sale. The biggest asset they have isn't the hardware, it's the data. Mm. And so for me, part of it was that I want to own my own data. I want to control my own data. I understand that the devices, in order to use them, will have to send some data to like those manufacturers' servers. But I also have the ability to later, if I want to ever erase the data on those servers, I could, <laughs> and then still um, maintain it on my local, you know, um, warehouse. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, so it's kind of like a weird uh, kind of a sense of privacy, right? Because it's like open I'm privacy. About, well, it's yeah, it's like it's it's almost like elective privacy. I want to make sure that. Like I want control of my data, but I don't mind sharing my data, but mm -hmm. I want to, you know, but I want to be able to say who I share it with. So, you know, so the fact that I'm worried about these other co companies getting my information and reselling it, uh, is kind of one aspect, but then yet I'm, I'm happy to share it with, you know, the public mm -hmm. where I, you know, if I know it's, if I know it's for like a non-commercial purpose. Mm. And you know, that's what I'm also, I like people like yourself, I love reading case studies and that's the best part about um, this whole biohacking movement or N equals one or quantified self is when people share information like, hey, I did this stuff. I noticed this result. Um, interesting. Maybe it might work for you. Maybe it might not. But that's the kind of information that, that uh, I believe helps us make a better decision in our health and makes us more informed versus waiting 20 years for a, a large randomized control trial to be released in some journal to maybe be you know, with stats and oh, I just and then you think practically, I had to wait either a long time or someone fudged the results or they. It's not very clear clinically what I can do or. So this is yeah, I love that. You know, this is why I love the stuff that you're doing and yeah, you're sharing it. Yeah, and if anything, I hope it helps people. You know, just be more inquisitive about themselves and maybe inspires them to you know start set up some of their own either experiments or even just start doing some more self observation, just like learning more about themselves. Um, yeah. You know, I don't think we, I don't think it's about who can, who's the craziest person that can put you know stick the most things into their body, and you know that's it's not a it's not a competition by any means. It's um, um it's really just about sharing knowledge. Yeah, and that's it's, it's you know when you listen to someone's story, I believe it's it, it might just spark a moment when someone's doing something. Oh, hang on, actually, let me try this, or you know, I just want to see how I feel because that's something I've been wanting to deal with maybe, or it's that awareness factor which is fantastic. Yeah, and I I love it when um you know, somebody writes me or contacts me and says, you know, I saw, I saw what you wrote about such and such, um, self experiment. I replicated it and like, check out my results or, you know, maybe mm. they were totally different or, or they validated something. And, or I, I even like it when someone points out something maybe in my methodology that they said, you know, you should have done this this way. It might've helped you 
do the experiment a little better. Because I think something I've learned, especially over the last five or six years, is like when you prescribe, let's say, to a certain diet or anything, like we, we accept it as dogma and like you don't challenge those, those think, that thinking. And I'm, I'm all about constantly questioning myself. So like even, you know, I'll go back to things I wrote or did five years ago and I'll be like, yeah, that's what I was thinking at the time. But maybe my my thinking has evolved or I've gotten um, other uh, just I've, I've just been exposed to other information that maybe has challenged those viewpoints. And mm-hmm. I think you have to sort of be that way. And, you know, and it's not about it being stuck in like one way and that that is the answer i think we should always be questioning especially today where i mean there's so many people out there you know spewing a lot of advice and 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 experts out there and you know and and listen there's a lot of great ones and folks are out you know out there whether it's on the medical side health side wellness side training side but until you actually try it out for yourself and you can you know question it and say maybe this person's right but it it didn't work for me the way that they said it would work for everybody yeah that's for sure um Um, yeah I, I got to speak to um, Professor Stuart Phillips. Um, I haven't released it yet uh, about protein. And yeah, we were talking about, you know, how you go from someone on a ketogenic diet who might eat not much protein versus someone on zero carb diet who eats a lot of protein. And just, yeah, mm-hmm. you've got two human beings, but how they res- re- will respond differently. And you've got people who move between the two extremes potentially there. So, um, yeah. And we're, we're even seeing that now where like people that are pretty prominent and like, like let's say like the, the paleo diet community where they're actually now understanding like you have to even personalize it a little more. There's people have different, let's say um, their tolerances for different types of carbohydrates can be very different. So mm. some people actually need, some, you know, you, you, some people just can't be ketogenic or other people need to, te- you know, work carbohydrates in, in a certain way. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's all about, you know, not accepting anything as like, this is it for everybody and you can't change it. Yeah. And that's, that's the best part about this. It's like, just go experiment. Every day could be different for you. You know, you're not stuck in a certain way. You know, try something. If you feel, if your body's telling you it doesn't feel quite right for you, don't feel like you get stuck in it. Go try something else. That freedom. Sure. Uh, so, I'm going to get into some of your biohacking quantified self stuff now. Um, sure. First thing I'm interested in, you live in New York City. So, I think the one thing people don't think about is the environment they live in. And I've always thought maybe one of the hardest environments to live in is a is a built-up city like New York City. I mean, in high rises, so you're talking about the air quality, you're talking about the amount of sunlight that you get because the buildings are so tall with the shadows or that you're stuck, you know, um, transiting mainly in covered spaces. Um, you've got all the EMF stuff. You've got so Wi-Fi and cell signals going off even more condensed in that kind of area um how do you find it trying to stay healthy in a big city like new york <laughs> yeah you know they say you know they say new york city is dangerous but it's not because of the crime <laughs> it's because of the environment um yeah it's it's definitely a valid concern and, and it's something that i've been really exploring over the past few years realizing that you know as much as we talk about you know self-optimization and biohacking and all that it's it's you know if we're not if we're not able to mitigate the effects of our environment on us in modern living it's it's you know it's it's all for nothing so you know I, I began exploring just the areas of my environment so I looked at um, things like air quality indoor um, just the indoor environment so that could be um, we talked about things like non-native EMF exposure just other areas water quality and I, I really kind of spent a lot of time kind of going down that that, uh, that rabbit hole and, and and understanding not just like within my home kind of where I could um, optimize things or, or mitigate, let's call it for lack of a better word, um, some of the effects of the environment around us. But even just walking down the street or outside um, or like you said, you know, trying to ensure that I get enough uh, quality sunlight during the day and, and, and you know, fresh air. It's, uh, it's, it's a, it can be a challenge. I think we uh, we're not often overlook that. And that's, that to me is probably the most important aspect of any <laughs> type of biohacking is you want to figure out the ways that will help as much as possible mitigate those, um, all of the effects of the, you know, we call modern living. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, and I think New York city is just like, you take all the worst of everything and you put it into one, <laughs> one, one little, like, you know, a few square miles and that's, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but you know, it, and it's one of those catch 22s where, you know, I've, I've chosen to live here. I've lived here for, for close to two decades, uh, you know, just because professionally and personally and all that. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I do know, like, I'm making a conscious decision about that. And I realized that 
that's that is having some effect. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, so that's why I'm working harder to try to mitigate as much as possible. Mm. So let's start with diets and some of the experiments that you found. So do you feel that you, for your own personal situation, that there's a particular way of eating that is maybe optimal for long-term health? So I would say, you know, the an area that got me pretty excited over the last few years was, uh, is, you know, we talk a lot about fasting and, and different variations of fasting. So I, you know, when I started, my diet switched over from a very sort of lean, very low fat diet to something that you call like more paleo or even like bulletproof for lack of, a, you know, kind of that, that world of dieting. Um, I then started using uh, intermittent fasting sporadically throughout. I worked it in, I wor- eventually worked it up more and more. But at the time, if you, like, I found that that intermittent, so I don't know if I need to explain intermittent fasting, but it's no, you know, so, pretty, yeah, it, it's yeah, it, yeah it's, so it's yeah. just times when you uh, you don't eat for X amount of hours, so you correct you, you purposely don't eat, and there's different hours and ratio and time frames that people use. Correct, and and then what I found was because I had other underlying sort of things going on with myself, that was an added stressor that my body really didn't want at mm-hmm. the time, so it actually. Um, created like it actually uh, hindered <laughs> some progress in other areas so i don't realize like i could you know let's say an area like your, if you had thyroid issues for example so until you kind of get those resolved you couldn't really work it in once i was able to get to a point where i was in a better state of, of being uh i then you know I, I experimented with intermittent fasting and then i started looking at things like uh doing like a one day fast or uh, protein restricting one day so i'm kind of not eating the same amount every day and just seeing you know how I felt or changes to you know energy levels and all of that, I then came across um, a researcher out of USC. Uh, his name is Walter Longo. He he did this research on what's called a, a, a fasting mimicking diet. And so what he did is he he came up with a protocol where you could eat a min, like a minimal amount of calories over a, say a five day period. So the whole fast, the whole FMD lasts for um, five days. And you get all the benefits of, as if you ate nothing for five days. And this is like something that started out with, you know, in the lab with mice and all that. We eventually got to human subjects. And he was, you know, seeing really tremendous results from this. And um, he, he has since, like, there's a commercial product he developed out of that, that I think that, that doctors are giving, you know, these are mostly, mostly for people trying to lose weight. But I found that, like, the, all the documentation about the diet, he had, he had patent filings and all that. So I was like, like, you know, I'm a biohacker. I'm like, like let's reverse engineer it. And, um, and, 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 you know, in a nutshell, I was restricting, you know, eating, let's say, half an avocado a day and some, uh, uh, some raw vegetables. And it's mostly a plant-based diet, so I'm, like, I'm not saying to do that long-term. But for this, it was about eating a minimum amount of calories, lots of uh, some broth, like uh, soup broths and, and things like that. So you're getting some nutrients in your body. I, um, I worked in some, uh, like greens powder just, and, and a little bit of salt just because over time you need to support your adrenals and, and all of that. So long story short was I, I started it. I did this five day protocol. I figured out all the macronutrient ratios, the micronutrient components of everything that I needed. And after about, so I was measuring glucose and ketones pretty regularly. And then it took me up still about a little over two days before I got into like a good, um, my, my like a, a nutritional ketosis. So, you know, you kind of, if you imagine like a curve, you know, your ketones are going to slowly rise, slowly rise, and then they're going to kind of shoot up. Uh, and after about two, two and a half days, I kind of got into like a deeper state of ketosis. And then my glute, while my glucose was just plummeting, which obviously if I'm not really consuming much, it's going to go down. So they sort of invert. And, um, you know, I, the, you know, I, I've done things with, with ketosis before. So I know the feeling of like when you're like, you're, you got super focused or you feel, you're like actually full of energy. And, and I was experiencing that pretty, pretty drastically. You know, I had really intense dreaming. Um, and so my brain was kind of like just really loving, you know, it was running on ketones, didn't have any, it wasn't it ran out of any kind of glucose to, to work off of. And, um, I did a bunch of testing like before and after. So blood testing, I was measuring glucose, ketones. I, uh, I, I measured a lot of other data points that at the end of the day, I ended up throwing out because they didn't really change. So like I was actually measuring, like I was doing like blood, blood pressure every day. I was measuring pH, urinary pH and all that. And, you know, I'd made a big spreadsheet and tracked it all. And then, you know, in retrospect now, if I did the experiment again, I would just not use it because those didn't really add any value to the experiment. Um, at the end of the experiment, I retested, uh, in terms of like blood work and, and there were some pretty, like with the, 
fasting mimicking diet, like the, the papers and things I read on it were talking about was when you do a refeed, so the most important part of the diet is actually when you do your, when you actually start eating again, because your body turns on a lot of these systems. You, you start generating, um, like things like testosterone will just shoot up, um, uh, you know, human growth, the growth factors and things like that will just, will just shoot back up because your body's like, I'm not starving anymore. And that was, for me, that was what I observed. I saw like a huge spike in testosterone. I actually was, I actually thought I would have d diminished markers for things like liver, uh, markers because of just being in a fast, but every, actually they improved. Um, and, and everything kind of really got dialed in. I would say the only thing that got a little out of line for me was, um, I had some, my cortisol levels went up a bit which I guess just, you know, from the stress, you know, I guess there, there's a little bit of that going on. So, you know, and I would have probably added some stuff to, if I did it, you know, the next time I do this, uh, the FMD, I would add in maybe some, just some additional micronutrients or things that can maybe help support, uh, things like kidneys and, uh, and liver. Okay. So there's, but, some, so it sounds like that with this, you, you eat a minimal amount for five days and then you go back into your regular eating pattern. Do you, is that correct? So the, the way that they, uh, recommend is it's a 30 day cycle. So you do a five day, um, fasting mimicking diet. And then the other 25 days, you just go back to eating as you normally do. And just everything else is the same. And, and they actually saw the benefits will actually magnify after the second cycle, third cycle. So I know, I know people who have done like four or five cycles where they, once a month they're doing five days of this and they're okay. the improvements, um, to like areas like whether it's their immune system or, you know, just, just like testosterone and those levels are just like, you know, they're, they're seeing like those changes really uh, magnified. Okay. So it's interesting if someone who feels they don't feel great on uh, a full fast or uh, intermittent fast, there's this other option then where you actually are eating a minimal amount on the fasting days, but you're doing this for five days in a row and then just going back into your regular cycle again, your regular eating yeah. pattern. Right. And, and I mean, it's, and it's pretty minimal though. So you, I don't want to think of like you're eating like a lot of food all day. I mean, you can, you get away a little bit by like, if you want to sip on some tea or broth, it helps, you know, keep, just keep your stomach a little bit full. But like my, the first day you have a slightly higher caloric intake. Um, so for me, I think it was like the first day was maybe 800 calories, but then days, days two to five, it cuts down. And I was at about maybe 400, three to 400 calories each of those days. So it's, I mean, it's, I'm so sitting here nibbling on like one little piece of raw cauliflower, just like and savoring it because that was my meal, you know, for the day. I was just like, oh, or, you wow. know, eating like, or very, you know, very slowly eating half an avocado and, you know, just savoring every <laughs> bite of it, you know. So, so it's, it's, you know, for some, some people actually, maybe they feel like doing a regular water fast for them is a little easier because they're not teasing themselves with like by eating foods. And, but I, I felt like it helped um, for me just having a little bit of, of something in my, in my body. Okay. Is, is a and, so, and so you feel this is a good way for you now after um, experimenting, you quite like doing this um, fasting mimicking diet. I do. I think, um, you know, I, I there, there's a variation of it. I think that some people will do who haven't, there's like a three day version that, you know, you might not see all the benefits from a, from a ketosis standpoint, because you're not, maybe it's not enough time to, to get there. But I think even just, you know, someone doing a one day fast once a week, I think people see it, like it kind of helps reset <laughs> their the bodies. And I know a lot of, I have friends who will, you know, maybe they'll pick one day a week, maybe like it's over the weekend or something and they'll just pick a 24 hour window where they, they just won't eat anything. And, you know, maybe they do it right before bed one night to the next night. So you spend half the time actually sleeping. So it's not like as, as much of a, uh, psychological. Burden, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're basically like, you're spending, let's say 16 to the 24 hours in bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Um, and you're, a, are you a fan of um, low carb and high fat kind of diets? Personally, yeah, I am. I, um, I, for me, I, I can't go like going zero zero carbs like that low for me. It just, I, it just doesn't work well. I, I go very low though. Um, I will up it a little bit if if I'm doing some intense exercise or like great, you know after after an intense workout or something or something or competition. Let's say. Um, but I, I, I feel like I, I don't think it's a one size fits all for everybody. I, I do think in general, like, you know, uh, quality fats and having a higher level of fat intake, I think anyone I've, you know, friends or family that have, that have tried it or switched over to it, have seen changes, not just, you know, to their, you know, physiology, uh, whether it's, you know, body composition, weight and all of that, but just, you know, cognitive wise and, and, um, 
yeah, it's, you know, it's, I, I think a lot of it for people is just the concept of like, wait, I eat more fats and that makes, you know, that's actually going to help me, let's say either lose weight or, uh, just have more energy. Mm -hmm. And so I, so yeah, so I prescribe to, uh, I mean, I'm not going to call myself, um, keto. I mean, I, I, I do things like intermittent fasting and all of that. So I'll, I'm always in a state of like, let's call it nutritional ketosis for a part of a day. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always getting there. So for me to, uh, I can get into it a little like faster now, obviously than a few years ago. But, uh, but I definitely will consume some carbohydrates, but just, you know, I'm not eating hundreds of grams of a day, you yeah. know, I'll, I'll, I usually, you know, save it for, um, for when I actually need them. And, uh, you know, and so that, then you get into things like timing, like when do you actually time those carbohydrates and, and knowing which, which, um, types of carbohydrates maybe have, like some will actually spike your, you know, your, your glucose more than others. And so you're trying to find ones also that maybe, uh, have a smaller amount of spike, unless you're, you want that effect. Like let's say maybe you're working out and you want to get that, you know, cause you have your insulin response and everything is different after a workout and you want to you know, get the, get all the glucose shuttled into your, into your cells. But I, um, and that, and that, and that was something that came out of, uh, there was some research where they compared a group of several hundred people and they tried out different carbohydrates on them. This is actually in a book that came out recently by, uh, uh Rob Wolf's book is called like, the, uh, it was called wired wired to eat i think it's called and it's um he talks about the study where you just every day and you can replicate anyone can do this experiment i'm i'm actually about to do it and i so i'll be posting it soon i know some other people have posted it online you there's a number of different types of carbohydrates so it could be white rice or a sweet potato and things like that and you take 50 grams and you measure your glucose uh before you take it and then you measure it let's say 30 minutes and 90, 60 minutes 90 minutes after and you can plot a curve and what you'll notice is um, and so you have to kind of do one each day cause you want to you know, separate them and isolate them. And what you'll see is your body will have a different curve, a response curve to each of those types of carbohydrates and, you, and something like you might think that something like, let's say you had like a chocolate chip cookie or something, let's throw something out there. Like you might think that's terrible and it creates a crazy, you know, it's going to create a huge spike. And for someone that actually might not, whereas a little bit of white rice might just totally spike up their, uh, their blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And so based on that. You can now take that information, and if you want to, you know, let's say you want to remain low carb, you you now know what kind of carbohydrates you should be, you know, kind of focusing on. Yeah, and and, and for you, it would be very different than somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so I guess was Rob talking about something postprandial eating, postprandial testing, where you check your your blood glucose one and two hours after eating something to see if you've had a response. I exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you want you, you do it before and then after, and then you know he was I think he was doing. I think he did six. I don't, yeah, I forget. It's, I think it was every thirty minutes or something. You know, but he did it up, up and out until about three hours or so. Yeah. I think. And um, and so you'll get you, and you basically just plot a curve. Uh, you know, he wasn't measuring ketones; he was just measuring glucose. Yeah, and um, that is, if anyone's listening, I always recommend that because that's um one of the best ways to even tell if you're on that road to diabetes because you can see your body's actually not controlling things properly two hours after a meal. So it's a it's a fantastic test that the, the post, but this is now isolating it to each individual item that you're eating on carb here, which will give you even more empowerment to realize ah, <laughs> I definitely know I can't eat that. Yeah, or or there might be cases where like you want that effect, so you maybe want you know if you're gonna if you want to have a spike in blood sugar, let's say out like some people after a workout maybe want to get that little bit of, of um, a rise, hmm. so don't for muscle growth. What, yeah. what, yeah, yeah. So you can sort of select what types of carbohydrates you want. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. um, so I, I want to talk about ketones now. You've mentioned ketones a lot, and I've had a few ketone people on the show. And the best part, though, is you've got to you've got to drink the golden elixir. You got to drink a ketone ester and do some testing. Could you just explain that? Sure. So. I, I, I know you've done a number of episodes around ketones or even ketone esters, and a lot of them are focused around um, sports performance. So, you know, uh, some Tour de France athlete will drink some before they do a leg of the Tour de France, and they'll see like, wow, I've got so much energy and my performance was amazing. Um, I, I was really interested in, in these pure ketone esters, and, and from what I had read, like, you know, people were making them in a lab for like $20,000 for like a, a tiny serving of it, and, you know, it wasn't something that was really available. And then I, I came across, uh, these folks that were producing a, uh, a ketone ester and I reached out to them. Cause I was like, 
oh, this is really cool. I'm like, I would love to try, you know, try this. Like I, you know, in my mind, it was something that still cost $20,000. And I was like, there's no way they're going to let me you know, try it. Because I, and I, but what I said to them was like, look, I go, I know that mostly athletes are using this stuff. I go, but what I want to propose is I want to see the effects of these um, ketone esters on cognitive performance. And I, I was like, because this is these are types of experiments that I was personally kind of messing around with, whether it was like in tropics and, and other things. And and long story short was I, I got hold of some some of these ketone esters. And uh, what I what I sought to do was see if just by taking a serving of them would they have an effect on my cognitive performance across a number of different areas. Uh, so if you've ever used like a an app or a site like um there's like Lumosity, these they're like they'll test your cognitive ability in lots of other uh, lots of categories. So from working memory to uh, to things like uh, not reaction time, but it was more like uh, kind of like pattern matching and, and all that kind of stuff. So these are your brain training games. Yeah, and so I mean, and, and there's a lot of debate about these things in terms of like it, using these regularly. Do they make you smarter or better? Like there was some controversy i i'm not making any claims about any of that i just wanted to use it as a as an assessment tool mm -hmm. so so the, the now the trick though is when you play these games there's a learning effect meaning you're gonna get better at just for a while you're gonna get better just because you understand how to play it so you're gonna get better not so much that you're thinking faster or your you know reactions are better uh so what i had to do is i spent a few weeks uh going through on lumosity they've got like 20 something games on there and i picked uh i think i picked 10 there's like two from each of the categories of games that they had. And I would just play them like not over and over and over every day. Cause what I wanted to do is get, get it to where my scores were no longer improving. They wanted to, I wanted to like kind of flatten out and get rid of that, that learning effect. That, um, that way I was kind of removing the variable of like just getting better at playing the games. So once I'd done that, I, uh, I then took the, uh, ketone esters and, uh, what do they, they taste me, like? <laughs> I, so I had heard, you know, stories where like they, they would make like Navy SEALs break into tears. They tasted so bad. But um, these, these these esters, they they somehow were able to slightly flavor them. It still tasted like uh, not pleasant. OK, uh, but, you have, but you have to get it down in one shot. You know, it's like I think I had uh, 40 milliliters of 40 milliliters or grams. I forget which. But it, it, it's um, it tasted like really bad tequila. So that's the only thing I can compare it to. Like a really bad, you know, so it's fine. I've had worse, you know, I've, I've had pretty bad tequila before. So I you suck it down. And they also recommended that you chase it with a little bit of um, sparkling mineral water. And that actually like made the taste go away. So it was like you, you drink it down, you're kind of like, kind of make a weird face. And then you drink the sparkling mineral water and it, you know, it's fine. So you, know, you take it and then within, um, you know, that within like 15 minutes, I started then um, measuring ketones and glucose. Um, and rat, I mean, I was in like therapeutic levels of ketosis within like even 30 minutes. Uh, like, you know, my, my meter only goes up to, it's like, uh, eight, eight millimolars per liter. I think it's the top of the precision extra meter. And it, it, so you get an error message if you go higher than that, because you're not supposed to ever go high. You know, it's the meters only made to go up to eight. So it meant that like within 30 minutes, I was like off the meter, um, but they wanted me to wait an hour before doing these cognitive tests again because they, they actually they and they said there's kind of a sweet spot where you're uh, and even in therapeutic ketosis where I think if you're between like six and eight millimolars per liter or seven and eight there's like a sweet spot where the body that is going to optimize is will work best with those um, ketone esters like you can actually if you go way too high it can you, there's actually toxicity issues like you can it could be bad if you go yeah. like people that can go up to like you know, 10, 16, you know, there's, it can be dangerous. So they yeah. wanted you in that sweet spot. Um, so it turns out that I actually took too much, too much of the esters because they were trying to base it on the dosage was based on my body weight, but they also have to factor in it. They're estimating kind of how keto adapted someone might be. So I, I was probably more keto adapted than they thought. So I went higher. I kind of overshot it, but, but at, by an hour, when I started doing the, um, the cognitive experiment, I was actually in the sweet spot, so it actually it, it worked out. So I, I, you know, I got I got in um, I, at the hour mark. I went through and like replayed all these um, sort of game, brain games again, and um, and I was pretty amazed by like things that had been flattened out that I'd gotten rid of the learning effect. Like I saw areas that went up by as much as thirty percent. Wow, of, that's huge scores. And yeah, I mean, and there, and there were a few areas that had very little change, but for the most part, everything across the board went up. Um, you know, from from like 
things that were like up to like 30% to like um, down to maybe just like, you know, 10% or even, you know, eight or 9%. And so I was, yeah, I, I did not expect that to happen, you know, and I, I you know, I was going to chalk a little bit of it up to maybe like, you know, my adrenaline was going, I was a little excited, but I couldn't explain like that big of a change. That was just um, really, really surprising, but it was cool. Um, so and that so- got me thinking of, I was going to say, and subjectively, when you're in that zone, so you, you, the, the game was telling you, hey, you're doing this better. But did you feel any different whilst you were actually doing the game too? Well, yeah. So I was still benefiting from that kind of feeling when you're in ketosis of you know you're you're, you're you have the super sharp focus. You're you're sort of you know you're dialed in, but you're not like um, you, you, it's not like you you drink a lot of coffee and you're all very like twitchy and nervous. You're just very, it's just like a lot of clarity and and I think almost for lack of a better term, like things felt a little more like, uh, like it felt very easy to like do things. I wasn't like, you know, this is the limitless thing that everyone tries to take nootropics for the (laughs) the brain supplement where you think, wow, I'm in the zone. Like think I can just do stuff now. And then it sounds like that's what the ketones does give you. Yeah. And it, I mean, it was definitely like that feeling of, you know, just, I wasn't having to try as hard, you know, I wasn't, uh, Yeah. I, you know, and now, now granted, you know, this is, these are great results and all that, but it's also a product that is not a bit you know, like these things cost so much money. I mean, I'm not saying that, that what I took cost $20,000. I think they're probably making this now in, in labs and figuring out ways to get it down to maybe a few hundred dollars a serving. So sure. If you're a professional athlete or, you know, they can afford it. Like if they're going to need it for a competition, I even think like a uh, professional poker players like could benefit from this. Like they can take it and have that, that like that they're playing some high stakes stuff. But for like someone like me, who's like a, a you, like you know the, the typical, you know overachieving person or weekend warrior type of athlete, like I, I just don't see that as being um, really something that in the near term is going to be like it's just you know unless you have a lot of money to uh, <laughs> to spend. I mean it's worth it if you have the money, but I I just don't think it's uh, something that you know I'm not going to be able to do that every day. It's not a part of my like you know daily ritual. It's, it's so are gonna we going to get this onto Wall Street so that the bankers can make better decisions? <laughs> <laughs> i think we need to get this into our uh political processes more than <laughs> uh, give, it, give it to the politicians but um but yeah it's it's uh i i i but i know like for example they're using this there's a huge therapeutic benefit from this from these ketones as well so like you know it's getting into like the medical community when you see people that are like um dealing with things like cognitive um issues like whether it's like alzheimer's parkinson's or uh even people that like have uh things problems like cancer where the body you know you're actually you don't want to feed it the glucose that thrives off of that so they're they're giving people ketones and seeing a lot of uh you know big benefits from that so i you know i do hope that this is something that they can continue to you know, build a scale of production of in a way that it can be available to to everybody. I mean, there's a lot of products out in the market now that are more salt based ketones mm. that you know you can buy, you can buy a serving for like five dollars or seven dollars US. The problem is they're salt based. It's a very it's a different sort of product. I mean, you'd have to take probably to do like to get the equivalent of what I did for that one experiment. I would have had to drink about seven packets of of ketone salts. Like seven servings, which would probably require like over a gallon of water. I'd also have to drink. So, um, and your guts and would be you're, terribly upset with that. And not to mention, that's a lot of salt. Um, and not only that, well, ketone salt. So ketones have two forms. There's like a left-handed, like if you think of a molecule, there's two forms of it. Are, and the bioavailable is only one part of that. So the esters are all bioavailable. It's called mm-hmm. the D form. Um, the L form we we can't really use, but the salts are fifty fifty. Um, of that so there's a, there's a bit of a danger too if someone tried to do it and said i'm gonna i'm gonna take down seven packets of esters of the, of the um not esters of the salts and and drink a gallon they're like sure i'll drink a gallon of water they're gonna do, then we're gonna check their ketone or their ketones might show that they're at like let's say seven millimolars per liter but really they're at 14 the meter only measures the d form of the pet so they might be actually in a toxic state um with so it could be dangerous so i wouldn't recommend you know, trying to do this same experiment with salts. I mean, you could try, well, salt. you could try with salts, but not that. Don't don't try to get your ketone levels up that high because you're only reporting it's only fifty percent of it. You have another fifty percent that's not going to show up on the meter, mm. and not to mention all the, your, the amount. That's a tremendous amount of salt to be putting in the body. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's sort of the trade off. So I hope you know maybe one day they find the happy medium, right? They find something that can be 
five to seven dollars <laughs> serving and you know gets you into a good state you know that that is something that you could almost like work into your everyday uh sort of stack or you know your, your routine well uh when we finish recording i'll give you a heads up on on someone who i think you want to talk to that it's going to be coming more commercially available i won't say any, anything at the moment so um awesome uh, okay so I, I'm I'm excited too. I, I hope I get to try and Esther one day. Um, I'm hopefully going to be in San Francisco in October, and I don't know. Maybe I might get lucky. We'll see. So <laughs> I might get to experience what you experienced a little bit there. But it sounds yeah, so it sounds so exciting just to just to feel that clarity. It's just from ketone bodies. So yeah, that's that's a great tip. Um, and that's also something I heard where people go into ketosis from fasting and they feel that zone too when they when they raise their ketone levels through fasting too. It'll be interesting if you, I don't know, um, if you would if you'd still get the, the big cog- cognitive boost if you were at, I don't know, seven millimolar from a seven-day fast. I don't know if you'd, if you know, if you had to not eat for seven days, would you still feel mentally very fast on those cognitive tests? Yeah, I think it just, that, that becomes more of an issue of... Uh... <laughs> You know, you've been fasting for, you know, you're, you cognitively might feel really sharp, but your body could be maybe a bit worn down because yeah. of, you know, you've been fasting for seven days. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, that would be a good experiment. You should try it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, I mean, gosh, you've got so many good, good uh, experiments here that we could talk about. Um, I know you're a big fan of light, red light, same as me. Um, do you, so, do you use lights? Um religiously like through your day that's is a big part of your your hacks in the day to improve your body yeah i do um you know and i i view light is just another delivery mechanism of you know it's 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 all about wavelengths of, of electromagnetic uh, information so whether it's light or things like pemf or there's other ways to deliver that that those signals into the body um so for me light is you know obviously nothing replaces sunlight so I, I make an effort to, uh, you know, get out in the sun as much as I can, especially when it's available. So obviously in the, I'm in the Northern hemisphere. So right now it's kind of like a peak time of the year. It's perfect to go out and get some sunlight. Um, but in terms of like, you know, versus like the winter where maybe it's a little more challenging and you have to maybe find other ways to get, to get some of, uh, some of the, U, some of the UV wa- um, wavelengths. But I, um, so my light sort of experiments are around, uh, you know, everything from just my ambient light, like in home, um, you know, we probably talked a lot about mitigating the effects of things like blue light at night. We can talk all about those sorts of things. Like I see you're wearing, you know, glasses right now that are going to probably help you during the daytime dealing with some of the harsher, um, wavelengths there. Um, when you get into like red light and all of that, I, I started experimenting with red light, um, and infrared light. Uh, a few years back, I, I was trying to overcome some gut issues, and I and so and I was reading about people shining essentially certain wavelengths of light right through your belly button because you have a major artery that's kind of right there. So if you think about blood irra- irradiation, it's a great point because your blood's going to circulate every like 20 minutes or so, and you can you just put the uh, and the light is basically like a, a it's a circular lamp that's probably about that big. It's a they call it a UFO light, and I located one. I didn't want to buy like a spend a lot of money on one, so I got one in China essentially that I knew I, I there you know that had the right LEDs the way I wanted them, certain power output, and I would you know I'd put it six inches away from my stomach and sit there for you know, each day for about twenty minutes and see you know and the, some of the initial things I I thought it was going to have effects like on the radiation being like oh it's going to help with any gut issues and all of that, but what I found was. It was just giving me a jolt of energy. Because <laughs> like I'd come off of like I'd be done after 20 minutes and I'd be like, well, why am I so energized? And you know, now we know a lot about things like mitochondria and and the power plants of the you know the body and, and how they love certain certain you know wavelengths of, of light. Um, so now as part of my you know daily uh, kind of rituals, like I'll integrate definitely um, the reds and, and some some infrared light into you know getting that into my body. Um, even you know we talk about things like uh, saunas. You know, the infrared saunas are um, using different kind of wavelengths now in the uh, the from near infrared to far infrared. So I I did a lot of experiments or usage of the saunas, and I did experiments around detoxing. So like heavy metals, for example, and I found like 
the ability for these, uh, you know, you're basically sitting in front of, you know, things you can't see. So most, uh, if you're like in a, a full spectrum infrared sauna, you, you're not really seeing any of the light, the wavelengths are penetrating your body and getting deep into your tissues. And it actually has effects on whether it's boosting immune system or, or helping with detox. And then, um, you know, I also have like, I, there are people have built their own like near infrared saunas. You can buy these like, um, re- these bulbs that are kind of like you would think if you went to like, a is it like a, a kitchen in a restaurant that's heating the food up kind mm-hmm. of like those big bulbs like and i think they use them in like chicken coops and things to keep the everything warm you know the, the chickens and the eggs warm but you can buy these bulbs and I, I i basically put together my own infrared near infrared sauna that i got bought some of these bulbs set them up in on a I, I found a cheap uh shoe rack that i can wheel around and kind of position it where i want and i can just like stand in front of it or sit in front of it for 30 minutes or so and you know just maybe turn my body around a few times and that penetrates pretty deeply into the body and you're like you really sweat and and um if you want you know from a good like uh the, the near infrared for me was more of like that that's a great thing for uh you know helping boost immunity and, and your immune system whereas the again the far infrared um is tends to have more of a uh, more detox effect. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and there's and there's other devices that have come out now where um, that are kind of playing off of that. So like there's a device called the Quantlet that you uh, wear on your wrist. And it, I wanted to bring so, that up because I saw you got one. Yeah. So the um, the you know that came out of the concept of um, I, I think at Stanford University they developed this product called the Stanford Glove, and what they found was they you put it was it, it was like this giant device that you had to, uh, you sit in a, you sit in a, like a, on a table and you put your arm in this giant sleeve and they run, uh, they were running like cold, uh, water through it. So it was trying to cool your, cool your skin while at the same time they were trying to hit your, uh, kind of get into your blood. I mean, I think through the wrist and get certain wavelengths of light in there. And the idea was that the cold plus the light would have these effects, you know, on your body, but different wavelengths would do different things. So maybe like the red and infrared could have uh, things more towards wellness protocols, whereas maybe like other lights can almost be like jet lag, you know, it's blue light or green light, things like that. Uh, so the Quantlet was kind of like, if you take something like that Sanford glove, which you really can't go and like work out, you can't wear it while you're working out. It's like this giant thing attached to a table. Uh, they built this product that's like a wrist worn device that, um, you can run different programs on, which, uh, you know, I, and I, you know, I've been following the, like the work of the invent, the people that kind of created it. And I, so I have one and it's, it's, it's cool. Like, I mean, people always ask me, so what do you think of it? Is it, you know, and I was like, you know, yeah, I've only done certain experiments with it. I, I definitely know, like if I put it on in the morning and we're blasting like all the different wavelengths of light, um, and while cooling my wrist, it, you know, you're going to feel like you, you do that with a cup of coffee in the morning and you're going to, you're going to feel pretty good. Um, I also found that like at night, if I put on like some more of the, the red and, and infrared kind of, uh, wavelengths, it, it's something that will, um, uh, kind of help me relax. And, you know, the same way we put on blue blocking glasses to let your body sort of, you know, those, those, everything's red, it kind of induces melatonin, that kind of thing. So I, uh, yeah, so I've, you know, I've kind of been, I'm still experimenting with it in terms of, um, you know, what, what you don't, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's one of those things where it's like, it's a device that says, you know, you can kind of do anything you want with it. You can customize all the programs. So, so I often spend a lot of time just sort of playing around with it and just understand it before I try to, you know, then I think of experiments I can run with it instead of like trying to jump right in with something where I haven't actually mastered using the device. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But so, it's, uh, um, so I, with the, uh, the time that we got, uh, store, I, I want to find out. So you've done, I mean, I'm, I've just touched on the surface of some of your experiments that you've got here. Out of everything that you've done over all the years, would you say there is anything that you think is a no-no or is just not worth your time? Uh, it, something, it, did you, because I know a lot of this stuff will tend to either feel good or you just st- still feel the same. I guess, was there anything that you've done that just you went, oh, I actually was worse when I when I tried to do that biohack? <laughs> Well, it's one of those things where I maybe felt wor- felt worse, but then I learned from that experience, and then it ended up, you know. So we talked a lot about light, and yeah. um, I've had a few experiences where I was shining certain lights on my head, you know, my especially my forehead, kind of areas like here, and kind of like scrambled my brain for maybe a little while. Like where I came out of it, like I can't, like I was having trouble speaking, or I couldn't pull a thought, you know. So maybe I I somehow overstimulated 
one of my <laughs> frontal lobes or something. And I, and then when I kind of learned like, what's the right dosage? Okay. Maybe I put too much on there. And, um, you know, I think there's things like that. Um, I, I, um, one of the things that I, I, I try to do is I, I try to research the hell out of anything, like anything I'm gonna, before I do any experiment, like I'm, I'm not just going to pop a bunch of pills or, you know, stick something into my arm or whatever. I, I really want to, like, I research the hell out of it. I want to make sure also like there's certain safety measures. So like I've got devices that do, um, like TDCS, which is transcranial direct current stimulation. So the idea would be like, you put two little electrodes on your, on your head, um, maybe even with like a nine volt battery. And by depending on where you place those on your head, it will stimulate certain regions. So people will use it to like, let's say, um, get more focused or they want to retain information faster. So maybe they're like studying a foreign language while they're stimulating or playing piano. And there's clinical devices that are like, I've gone to like seminars where like, you know, scientists from around the world are like finding success treating people with this sort of technology. But then you see these devices coming on the market that it's literally like a nine volt battery with two wires and like a tiny fuse. And I'm just like, uh, you know, and I'm just like, and then knowing what I know about certain safety measures, I'd be like, well, I want to do stuff with it, but I don't, you know, and I, I, I'd be like, well, it doesn't have a safety circuit on it. It doesn't have, you know, these other things. So I'd be like, I'm going to hold off on that one. I don't want to, <laughs> like, you know, that's, that's sort of, uh, damaging. Whereas, you know, there, there are other devices now that are coming out that are, they're, they're dealing with all those things and making it more, even for the consumer, like they're putting in those safety measures. So I would be more apt, more apt to do it. Um, but like the no, no stuff, it, it really comes down to like when you get into the, you know, what, what sort of, uh, pills are you throwing in your body and like, um, what are like the, where you might get a short term benefit from it, but what's the long term harm from something. And, you know, I'm seeing this, especially in the, you know, when you talk about longevity and people are saying, well, you know, I'm taking things like, uh, there's certain drugs, like maybe they're taking like metformin or something like that. And like, I'm just like, well, great. It might have a certain near term benefit. We don't know like what that might, ha what might happen down the road. So I'm, I'm a bit, cautious about things like that. Um, and if I do go down that route, I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I've, I've developed a nice network of, of experts in certain in different areas where I can definitely bounce, you know, information off of, and especially like I'll ask two people about something and one might give me a conflicting opinion of the others. So and I was like, okay, so no one's, if everyone agrees wholeheartedly that like, this is great, then I'll consider it. But if it's, uh, I get conflicting opinions that I have to kind of maybe research it a little more. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, that, and but yes. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess with the pharmaceuticals and some of the more hardcore stuff and electricals, yeah, you've got to be cautious. And as you said, you've, you've, you, you did a temporary, um, negative effects by shining too much light <laughs> into your brain there at the wrong wavelengths or the wrong, uh, dosages and that. So, um, but I, I also saw your, your Instagram is fa fascinating. I'm going to link to all your, uh, all your points in the show notes, but you've got a device that you've just implanted, have you? That's tracking stuff. Did I see that? Inside Tracker is that a new thing you've just installed? Or no, no, no. Inside Tracker is actually uh, in the US. It's a uh, a blood testing service. Ah, so they so they provide. Um, they're they're just uh yeah they they'll they'll you know you get a blood draw and then they provide in depth analysis and recommendations based on your blood work. So um, but in terms of uh you know I've done things like. IV nutrient drips. So there's, you know, putting, putting, injecting things or taking blood out. It's not, it doesn't really bother me. Um, you may, have, I'm trying to think what you might've been thinking about though. There was another, uh, by implant, I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor for a while. I don't know if that was so, so like we talked a bit about glucose measurement and how it's, a, you know, it's, it's like one data point mm -hmm. and, 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 and there's these continuous glucose monitors that, that historically, um, a di type one diabetics would have to wear because they have to monitor their the, the glucose and their insulin levels and all of that. So what's come out now is a new new device um, that is uh, essentially the size of it's the U.S. quarter. It's very small, and you implant it. It goes right on the bottom of your uh, kind of like your tricep, and it, and it, it it lasts for two weeks. And what can, it takes readings every few minutes, and you can pull the data off. And now, so for some of these experiments, it gives me another level of granularity. I, I can, instead of me having to like go through the process of pricking my finger in the morning. Like I was trying to uh, do experiments around sleep and something I noticed was like, I would wake up during the night uh, at some point, maybe, you know, and I couldn't figure out why was it the air quality of my room and other things, but wearing a continuous glucose monitor, I could see, I, I can measure my glucose now while I was sleeping like the whole night. And I could see that I actually would go hypoglycemic at a certain point in the night. So if I, if I didn't, if I ate at dinner, let's say I was finished by 8 PM, 
um, somehow my, my body would go, my blood sugar would dip and that your kind of a response to your too low blood sugar is your body would just naturally kind of wake up. And so, uh, you know, kind of figuring out ways to sort of hack around that was, it doesn't mean like, you know, take something sm- like before bed, a little bit of carbohydrate, something that like, I know I can fuel, fuel that, um, through the night to not have those dips, but but now also I can do these other, all the experiments I've done, I can kind of now do them with another level of uh, granularity because now you're getting not one or two data points a day, you're getting hundreds of data points a day. Mm-hmm. And this is something that, you know, it, I think is being sold. I think in the UK, it's available over the counter. Like you can go to any, uh, any pharmacy there. And uh, in the United States, it's a little more, you know, I think you have to go through a doctor here currently, but you can get them. Okay, yeah. I, d- yeah, I had another guest on the show, uh, Jeffrey Wu. And he was wearing a freestyle library, the one that was checking your glucose all the time. And you just scan over it and boop, yeah, you get to see your Exactly. Number. So that's, that's yeah. So a lot of us are, are using those now and they last about two weeks and, and then you have to sort of replace it. And, you know, and they have issues with some calibration and all that, but I think the trends are very accurate. So if you want to just get a sense of, you know, the rise, and, uh, you know, or, or dips uh, different times of the day. Um, but, but to your question about, you know, implanting things, that's, that's sort of the one area that I'm not like there's biohacking and that, even that in itself has different definitions, right? There's, there's you know, grinders to, and wetware, isn't it? Isn't that the other exactly, name for them? Yeah. Uh, well, wetware, I think is a, is a group, I think of, of biohackers there wetware or those grindhouse wetware is one group, I think in Pittsburgh in the United States that they, they, you know, they're coming up with devices that they can implant. I know there's some folks in Europe that are doing things with um, RFID chips in your kind of like a nit right between the webbing of your thumb and your uh, index finger. Yeah. That's a fairly, I mean, it seems really crazy and all that, but honestly, if that's a simpler procedure probably than piercing your ear. <laughs> it's like a very, you know, simple, because although it's not like as freaky as it sounds, and, and you know, and there's people who put magnets in their fingers and, you know, to try to gain another uh, or, ga- or enhance a sense, uh, which is kind of cool, but, but I'm just not, for me, I'm trying to, my, my, my angle of biohacking is really more about trying to optimize and, get to a point with with what i have that you know get the best state i can i'm not putting any of that down it's just uh, for me i'm just very i'm not i'm not there yet where i necessarily want to like implant something in in myself um unless there was some huge gain i was getting out of it i think um you know some things that maybe are people are doing i can maybe i could do that just outside of my body so you know I, I can still wear i can wear you know something on my wrist or my finger that tracks some biometrics i don't necessarily need to put that in my in my under my skin mm-hmm. yeah, but, you- I, but i think yeah, I think, but I think what they're getting to is maybe like, you know, we're five years or 10 years out where, you know, they're, they're putting stuff that maybe is relatively large and, you know, kind of implanting something, but by then it'll be something that's like sub you know, almost microscopic, you know, so they're, you know, they're kind of laying the foundation for that. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I'm the same. I also think with, with all the, the health improvement tips that someone can do in my, my own philosophy is, is this sustainable and is this long term? You know, so there's times you you would know I, you can only do this because it's short term for a short term benefit. But really, at the end of the day, how do you live a long term good life? Because that's the goal at the end of the day. So it sounds like you're you're on that same path. No, exactly. And even with like you know self tracking, quantified self, I think we could talk about tracking all these different things. And I'll admit, like there's certain there's different granularity of tracking. Like there's things that are more like set it and forget it. Like the wearables and stuff are just tracking. So as much data as I can get, great. But for example, I might be tracking, you know, something like blood pressure or or uh, key, or uh, let's or pH of my urine or something like that. But it, in those things, maybe I'm not doing every single day of the year. Maybe I'm doing it because like I'm doing a certain experiment. I need to have more data points around that five days, let's say, or seven days, and then I kind of say, okay, I'll set that aside for a while. Now I don't need to be doing that every day. So you have to, so you know you figure out like what's going to create the least amount of burden. So you don't want you know the whole saying of like don't let the don't let the uh, data own you kind of thing. It's like you know, if we're trying to optimize ourselves and, and, and the act of collecting and tracking data becomes too much of a burden, we're actually like defeating the purpose of optimization. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, Bob, um, how can people follow you and your experiments or read up on your past experiments? What, what are the different links out there to connect with you? Sure. The The main place where I document a lot of these experiments is at uh, quantifiedbob.com. Uh, and that's where that's basically like a, my blog. And I, I write about a lot of these things in, in depth. Uh, you can also go on Instagram uh, if you want to see more kind of like a day in the life. Uh, I tend to show off a lot of interesting things as they're happening. Uh, that's just quantified Bob on Instagram. Uh, also on Twitter, um, you can you can uh, go to quantified Bob on Twitter. Uh, or, you know, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, just my name, Bob Troya should be the, the first name that pops up and uh, happy to connect. Cool. Well, again, for all the listeners, I'm going to link to all of these um, in the show notes for everyone. 
Um, Bob, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing just a little bit of your knowledge today. I mean, there's so much more we could go into. Um, and I think I might get you on the show again because we could just talk about tons of biohacks and different health tips and, and uh, findings that you've come up with. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.